Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark O'Brien with the RX Abuse Leadership Initiative of Colorado, or RALLY. I'm honored to be here with you today on today's webinar and grateful to have each and every one of you here. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope that you have continued to stay safe and healthy as we continue to cope with the many challenges of the pandemic uh, and fires in our state, given the anxiety, stress, and isolation our society is facing during this time, it's no surprise that the pandemic has triggered a significant increase in mental health problems for people of all ages and backgrounds. The incidence of depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicide are all up, as is substance misuse and addiction. Along with all the other challenges associated with these crises, the opioid epidemic has also persisted. From April 2020 to April 2021, the United States experienced more than 100,000 overdose-related deaths, the most ever in a one-year period. It's up from 78,000 the year before. And we know that Colorado hasn't been immune to these trends. That's why today we're coming together virtually to listen, learn, and educate ourselves on the many ways we can work together to focus on mental health while continuing to fight substance misuse and keep our friends, families, loved ones, and communities safe and secure during this time of uncertainty. The RX Abuse Leadership Initiative of Colorado convenes national, state, and community leaders, like some of the folks I'll get to introduce to you today, to exchange best practices and provide resources that use prescription methods. Focus on educating the public about preventing opioid misuse, uh, spotting warning signs if we're concerned about a loved one, and talking to them if you suspect there might be a problem. Rally also works hard to connect committed partner organizations who provide resources and, and support. Our partners span all different types of industries uh, and, and people as the challenges of substance use disorder and mental health really know no, no boundaries and they don't dis discriminate. I'm excited also to be joined today by Aaron Boyle of Culinary Hospitality Outreach and Wellness, a wonderful rally partner who's co-hosting today's important discussion. So Aaron, I'd like to turn it over to you to introduce all our uh, other panelists. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Rally, for having us. Really appreciated and excited to speak to y'all. I'm Erin Boyle. I'm the executive director of Chow, and this is John Hinman, the founder of Chow. Hi there. Um, hi, I'm John Hinman, founder of Chow and owner of Hinman Pie. Chow's mission is to support wellness within the hospitality industry and to improve the lives of our community through our shared stories, skills, and resources. Um, in 1997, I began working in the restaurants in downtown Denver. Over my career, I became one of the best pastry chefs in town, not so much because I liked it, but because it was a very safe environment for me. I craved the community in the restaurants. I became very good at my job. Um, I did my best to just to be unfireable. I was a very creative guy, but um, it was a job that nobody really wanted to do. Um, and so it let me hang out in the industry a bit. Um, at one point, I even was a pastry chef for Hosea, who you'll hear from later um, in this um, webinar. Um, I worked in the restaurants because it was a good place to hide for me. I was alcoholic. I didn't know it at the time. But um, it, it, it was a, not the nine to five job. I was a real creative guy. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it, it suited my personality very well. I didn't have to be at work until 10 in the morning and I could stay out till five at night, you know. I worked so hard that I didn't have time to think. But, um, you know, finally, when I was 37 years old, I was facing four years of prison for uh, DUIs, four DUIs that had stacked up over time. And I was basically, you know, I lost my business, my car. I was homeless um, on mom's couch. That's the best thing I could do at 37 years old. So um, I took a couple of years off and um, that was almost 11 years now. And I've been um, sober. Um, and in that first year, I, I thought it was a restaurant industry that, that um, ailed me. So I had 11 different jobs, you know, I was getting, going to get out of this business, but I had no um, skills to do so. So of course, I, I wound up back in the industry. Um, 
And when I got back there, I started to see, um, well, when I was getting sober, I went to a different community and I heard through their shared stories about how to be sober and how to live a different life and how to be, you know, the person I, I will always strive to be. I just didn't know how. Um, so when I came back to the uh, restaurant industry, I saw similar wary eyes like mine. And, um, you know, my favorite flavor um, of food is the community, I think. You know, today I own a pie company and that requires a community to eat it. You know, it requires a conversation and it always makes, and it also makes memories. You know, it's pies are awesome. And um, so, you know, on a whim, I just decided to schedule a meeting at my bakery to see if anybody wanted to come talk about where this stuff, you know, affects us in our hearts and where it hurts this mental health and, and this, and this fear of life overall. So I scheduled a meeting and not thinking so many people uh, would show up to talk about this stuff. Um, the universe had different plans and unfortunately um, took Anthony Bourdain from us, who, you know, was a major um, player in our industry. You know, a lot of people looked up to him. So all of a sudden on a Monday night at my bakery, 30 to 40 people showed up wondering what the heck happened. And we just went around the room and started sharing our stories. And I quickly grabbed a pen and paper and I wrote down um, a lot of our similarities and Chow sprung up from there. In that meeting, quite a few people had talked about suicide. One person had talked about their plans for suicide that night. So when the meeting was over, I said, okay, we'll be here next Monday. And Chow just started like that in um, 2019. And since then, we've just been uh, growing and growing. And um, Aaron will give you some more of the details. But, um, you know, through our shared stories, Chow provides a great spot for, for people in the restaurant industry to come to get to that next phase in their life, to get through their next struggle. Um, it, we're uniquely qualified because we've done it. When you say, um, I work 16 hours today, that's what we do. You know, that, that's not the problem. You know, we're allowed, we, we, we talk a little bit deeper and we're seeing great results and people starting to change. And the idea of Chow is to put your, toe into the into the mental health community and then we'll help get you to the real help that you need but it's like a a baby step before that baby step of uh stepping into your life thanks thanks john so what chow currently offers is group discussion meetings uh we have seven each week and this gives folks an outlet to share what's going on in their work and personal lives it also helps a healthy community or offers a help, healthy community and seeks to provide motivation and encouragement to make healthy choices in their lives. We also offer what we call Amuse mental health training. Um, if you're familiar with the word Amuse, it's the, the small bite before a nice meal. So this is a small bite into the world of mental health, mental illness, recovery, and how to support folks that are struggling with mental health or recovery. This group focuses on us, the hospitality industry helping us. And this training is something that everyone can take so that people can learn how to lead and support a healthy hospitality industry. We also offer resource material. We have posters and postcards and wellness check-in cards to remind folks that there is help and resources available to them. Um, all of our services are offered for free and we try to find low cost or no cost resources that we post on our website. The wellness check-in card also has 24 seven hotlines for folks that need immediate help. We also have a partner, Kessid Wellness, and they offer three free clinical therapy appointments to folks in the hospitality community. Um, and they work on a, I believe, a sliding scale to offer affordable help after that. So that's what Chow is. And Mark, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, and thank you both, uh, Aaron and John, for the work that you're doing. Uh, and thank you, John, for for sharing your story with us and and for uh, that uh, that incredible narrative of of hope and and how you've made such a difference for your community uh, that's grown out of uh, your struggle. I appreciate that. Um, there Thanks, are Mark. many, yeah, of course, John, no problem. There are many leaders uh, and organizations on the local, state, and national levels who are making important progress against the opioid crisis. Um, and today we have the opportunity to hear from several of them. 
I'd like to highlight uh, the following individuals who've taken time out of their busy schedules to join us today and, and thank you all for, for being here. We're joined by special guests, uh, State Senator Larry Liston and State Representative Mark Snyder. We also have Chef Brother Luck, Chef Paul Riley, and Chef Hosea Rosenberg. Um, and with that, I'm happy to turn it over for remarks from Senator Liston. Senator Liston, welcome. Very good, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Hi, everyone, I'm State Senator Larry Liston, and thank you to Rally Colorado and Chow for inviting me to be a part of your today's event. <clears throat> and a special thanks to all of you for joining us today for this important conversation about a crisis which unfortunately has only gotten worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> opioid, opioid misuse has continued to sweep through communities in Colorado and across the country with overdose uh, death rates on the rise. I know we'll be covering some difficult topics today as we talk about the opioid crisis that is still so prevalent across our state. But I'm pleased to say that Rally Colorado and their network of partners are continuing their work to ensure that members of our community have access to helpful information and local resources. We have lost far too many loved ones to the opioid crisis. And it is crucial that we do everything we can to address substance misuse and support one another in these times of need. Organizations like Rally and Chow are making great strides in driving effective approaches to bring about true recovery for those in need, while also ensuring Colorado has the workforce it needs for a bright future. I hope today's conversation can help us all learn a bit about the opioid crisis that exists in our communities and ways that we can get involved to make a difference. And I'll just say on a personal level, uh, my wife for many years <clears throat> was a registered dietitian and worked uh, very closely with people in the hospitality and food service industry. So uh, I have a real soft spot uh, and admiration for all the good work uh, that you all do and especially for the chefs and, uh, and the staff, because you all are real entrepreneurs and uh, create so many uh, great jobs and uh, uh, ways to uh, employ good local people, with, not just with jobs, but with good careers in the future. So my special thanks to you all. It's a real privilege to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Liston, uh, for your remarks and, and also for your leadership on these issues. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Mark Snyder. Welcome, uh, Sen uh, Representative Snyder. Such a pleasure to have you here today. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you, John and Aaron, for telling me more about Chow. I did try to look it up a little while ago, and uh, I kept getting pictures of dogs with long hair and curly tails. So, uh, but I think it's wonderful uh, what, I, what I know of your organization. So hello everyone, I am uh, Representative Mark Snyder, House District 18, which covers all of downtown Colorado Springs, all the way out west to my hometown of Manitou Springs. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Brother Luck having been uh, an entrepreneur down in our region and opening up some uh, fine eateries. Um, I really wanna thank Rally Colorado and Chow for organizing this webinar and continuing to work across Colorado to turn the tide of this opioid crisis. You know, as we continue through the COVID-19 pandemic, it's also time for an important discussion about the intersection between mental health and substance misuse. We've been working to keep our communities and ourselves safe during COVID-19. There's been increasingly difficult struggles for those living with addiction and working to manage their recovery from substance misuse. Uh, there are important steps that we can take to help prevent addiction. One of the best things we can do to address the opioid crisis in our state and prevent substance misuse is to safely dispose of unneeded prescription medications. We must also be aware of the needs of our loved ones who are struggling and also know where we can go for help. I can tell you this is a personal issue for me I have two daughters in their early 20s, and uh, we've gone through some of the, the, just the scare and the worry and the problems associated with this. And like so many people, it starts innocently enough. You have your wisdom teeth taken out and they give you a big bottle of opioids. And uh, 
you know, for many people, that that's the beginning of a, a very difficult road. And so it's, it's by talking about it, bringing light to it, and having organizations like Rally and Chow out there to help people in various industries. So thank you all for joining us here today, and I hope you'll continue to stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Snyder. Thank you for being with us today, and thank you for your leadership and, and sharing your personal connection to these issues. I think it's really important for us to do. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the virtual microphone back over to Aaron so we can dive into our conversation with the, the wonderful chefs we have joining us. Thanks, Mark. So my first question is for Chef Brother Luck. Um, can you please describe your sense of overwhelm while trying to support your staff's mental health? And how is that important in order to keep them employed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first off, thank you everyone for joining us today, uh, giving us the chance to to talk about, you know, what we've got going on in, in our industry right now. You know, we're talking about mental health, we're talking about opiate addiction, um, but really what I look at is what where it comes from in the beginning. And, and when I look at these scenarios, you know, the biggest thing is people are trying to numb the pain, right? They're, they're, they're dealing with a lot of internal struggle. And that's one of the main reasons why I personally voice my advocacy for mental health, um, because I deal with it, right? I have a lot of pressure on my shoulders, as everyone on this call does, as many people in the world do. And that pressure uh, eventually will start to weigh you down. And the next part of that is where do you, where do you start to lead into? What, what are you going to depend on to kind of numb the pain? And as we look at the restaurant industry specifically, um, you're talking high stress, you're talking uh, tough work environments, you're talking a lot of pressure in very small amounts of time um, and very high expectations to perform. Um, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really, really, really hard recipe to, to execute uh, for many people. So this is why we see so much dependency when it comes to our industry. You know, besides the glamorized lifestyle that's been you know portrayed on television i think it's it's natural for people to want to just find that social gathering so you know when we look at mental health within our our business when we look at it within our industry my biggest discussion is why you know what is happening and when we look at the last 18 months of, of dealing with the covid pandemic and trying to keep people safe and constantly adjusting to you know the rules and the regulations and ensuring guest safety and, and our team safety, uh, the biggest thing that I, I've kind of come to the conclusion is we have broken trust with a lot of our staff. Um, we've taken away that certainty of their future, you know, that confidence that they're going to be able to uh, not only show up to work, make money, take care of themselves, take care of their families, but also, you know, we've, we've, we've lost the trust. And, and that's something that I think has been really hard. We've thrown a lot of dollars at it. And, you know, when we look at stimulus, we look at some of the grants that have come out, everything is, is, is cash oriented, but we're not addressing the bigger issue, which is the mental health. And this is where I'd love to see more businesses, more, more owners, more of our, our representatives truly paying attention to how do we get more professional help? to the staff? How do we start the dialogue? How do we start to drop the walls and get people to, 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 to share what's actually going on? You know, to be locked into in, in your house for a number of weeks, um, a lot of our staff don't have family, right? We come from uh, broken homes. We come from uh, the system. There, there's so many scenarios of, of, of where there's a lack of support the, the isolation, I think, was one of the biggest things that was a struggle for many of our team members, um, which is what led to different types of addiction and, and increased the consumption of, of pills and drugs and, and alcohol. So, you know, when we're coming back to work and we're saying, hey, the world's kind of op opened back up, we need you to move fast, get into fifth gear, that gear doesn't exist anymore. And, and, and that's one of the biggest struggles I think we're all, we're all seeing in our, in our industry right now. Um, one of the things that we, we've really been trying to figure out locally here in Colorado Springs is, is how do we get, you know, some kind of traveling therapist to, to actually come to the restaurants and utilize our private rooms and, and create an open dialogue and discussion 
I love what Child's doing because it does create a safe environment for you know many people to just come in and talk and, and share what's going on in their world. But we can only do so much. You know, we're professionals to a point. And I think when we're talking about behavioral, you know, this is something that's directly affecting our economy, the performance, uh, the labor shortage. You know, it, it really comes back down to the mental health. How are we rebuilding the trust? How are we establishing the relationship? And then how are we pushing our staff and our team and our community forward to, to believe in one another? Because I think that's the biggest thing we've, we've broken. So, you know, it's, it's tough, but every day we just kind of wake up and, and depend on each other. And, and the community is really what it's about. That's, that's what keeps me going. Um, the people in Colorado Springs encouraging me and, you know, just knowing that they're there for myself, for my staff. Um, but I think it's important to continue this dialogue because it's going to share um, a, a mutual feeling that a lot of us are going through, which is, what do we do? Because it's not about the cash at this point. Thanks, Brother Luck. So the next question I have is for uh, Chef Paul Riley. Paul, can you share a little bit about how your role as a chef has shifted from the classical expectations? Now it seems the expectations from your staff or your guests are that you should be competent in handling mental health crisis. Is there anything you'd like to see done? That's kind of two questions. You can take it one at a time. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, John, uh, and thank you to Rally and Chow for inviting me to be a part of this really important discussion within our industry. It's, and I think it's it's still a discussion that is um, it's emerging. Uh, you know, it's it's important that we we are uh, I, uh, even talking about it, which is what we um, which is recent within our industry for an issue that has been persistent for decades. So. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I've been cooking in professional kitchens for the last 30 years. And for about 14, 15 of those, I've been able to be a, a chef um, as the head of, head of my kitchens. And I'd say that, you know, as, as chefs, we wear, we wear many hats. We, and this is kind of an acceptance of the position, I think. Um, you know, and, and if I look back, you know, two decades ago, I, I, I still wear a few of these hats now, which is teacher, uh, leader, coach, often cheerleader for what we're doing for everybody else. And the other hats that I've kind of just happened by happenstance have, have had to take on through part of the mental health crisis include um, doctor, counselor, therapist, and psychologist, and um, I, I am all those things to all of my staff on on a daily basis. And um, what I what I like about all the, about those responsibilities is that it's also turned me into like both brother and father for the restaurant as well. So um, it, it's it's something that I don't take very lightly. And with um, institutions like Chow locally here in Colorado. Um, and, and there's another nationwide one called um, I've Got Your Back, which is done by my friend Patrick Mulvaney out of Sacramento, California. There, when, when, a, when a situation escalates beyond my um, capacity, which it often does um, within our, you know, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can wear all those hats, but sometimes, um, there's a professional has to be brought in. I can reach out to my friends, Aaron and John at Chow and, and say, Hey guys, I, I, I need, I need some help. I need some guidance in, in how I can give direction to one of my employees. In fact, I just, uh, Aaron, I think I hit you up like probably 10 days ago for something that was going on within my extended restaurant family. So um, the fact that there are actually these, programs and institutions that I can point people in the direction of is, is a huge change from the, from the, from the, you know, within the last couple of years. Um, but, but, but mental health has been an issue in kitchens long before that. So I think, um, you know, I, I, I love brother luck, what you were saying about like, we're continuing this dialogue because I really do believe that this is an emerging topic within our industry. 
And if we're not talking, we're only going to solve it by, by talking it out. And I think, you know, I go back to something that, that I've heard John Hinman say before, which is it's, it's okay to not be okay. And even just recognizing that statement um, and, and saying that out loud to, to, um, to your team is huge. And, and um, so now that we have identified that there's an issue, and you know, this is all very recent within our industries, we've identified there's an issue. We have programs like Chow that are helping. It's like, what are we going to do to get to the root? And this is kind of the second part of your question, Aaron, is um, what would I like to see done is we need to get to the root of these issues. And um, kind of, you, you, you've, you, I think we've all heard this before, that working, working in a restaurant, whether it's front of the house or back of the house, is hard work. Um, it is physically taxing. It is mentally tax, taxing. And... I think for so often we just kind of brushed it aside and said, yeah, but that's, 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 you, you, you knew that getting into it was going to be that way, which is a partial trade-off that, that, that bears truth. However, um, it, within the last two years of the pandemic, I, I've also had to say goodbye to two staff members that were friends of mine um, because they uh, decided to take their own life. And, so there is a there's a root problem that we that we have to get to here. And um, my restaurants, my restaurant group has started to enact weekly, daily um, check ins, if you will, with our team. Uh, for instance, like we use something called red, yellow, the beginning of all meetings. We, we use something called red, yellow, green. Um, and it's a safe space for people to um, to tell how they're doing. Um, green is your butterflies and rainbows. You're having a great day. You're having a good work week. Red is you're in the red. You are, you're, you are burning the midnight oil. You're exhausted and you aren't doing that great. And there can be any form of those colors in between. Um, and if somebody is orange or red for two consecutive weeks, um, we as a management team get with them outside of that meeting and see what else we can do and, 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 um, you know, check in with them separate from the group and talk it out and know that for them, it's okay to talk about this as a group. We have to talk about this. Um, we also do five minute monthly, five minute check-ins with all employees. And the first question we ask is, how are you? Um, you know, you, you, sometimes these, 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 these meetings will literally last five minutes. So they're like, I'm fine. I'm doing great. I have everything I need. And then there are other times that the quote five minute check-in is going to last 40 minutes. Hey, I'm not doing that great. Um, I'm bearing the weight of something that's outside of the restaurant. We try to use our restaurant as a, as a haven, as a safe space to say, you can leave that stuff at the door and come in here and be part of your restaurant family, but often it doesn't. And that's where we often, it's not just that easy to say that. So it's, it's, it's important that I think as a group and as leaders within our industry, we are talking with our teams um, about their mental well-being and their, and just where they are in, in their current state. Um, you know, we've also tried to, as a, as a restaurant group, we've tried to do other um, um, benefits for our team that can help through um, you know, challenging mental times, such as like paying a livable wage, getting people paid time off and, uh, and health benefits. And that sounds really easy, but these were things in the restaurant industry that did not exist for, for a really long time. And people were just forced to bear the weight of not having that, which led to more mental health issues. So I, I think by, um, you know, getting back to you know, long story long to answer your question, Aaron is, 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 we have to identify what the problem is. We have the resources to deal with the issue now and we're talking about it. But the next chapter by continuing this dialogue is we have to identify it at the beginning and how we can use um, our, our creative minds and our restaurant family to help, to help um, deal with those issues before they begin or once they begin, point them in the right direction. Thanks, Paul. And for, for those of you who don't know the restaurant industry that well, I want to I wanna be clear when Paul, uh, Paul says that he's asking how his team is doing really, or it's okay to not be okay. He's telling his team that that's all right. In the hospitality industry, that's, that's generally not the norm. 
you're, you're supposed to come in, leave everything at the door, put on your robot face and, and just get the work done. And maybe um, the representatives and senators understand that for public speaking events, but imagine doing that for eight to 16 hours a day. So this is a, this is definitely a new, a new thing in our Aaron, I think you may have muted yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the last question I have is for Chef Hosea. Uh, we all know that there's always been a problem with addiction in our industry. Have you seen any increases in substance use in the hospitality community since the beginning of the pandemic? Um, hi, everybody. Thanks, Aaron. Um, pleasure to be a part of this group. Um, bit of a loaded question, to be totally honest, because... Um, so much has been happening to all of us in the past two years, um, sort of amplifying a lot of the issues that are always there. Um, I really appreciate everything that uh, Paul just said, and as well as uh, Chef, Chef Brother Luck and, uh, and John for getting this whole thing started. I, I know them all professionally and personally. Um, I think we, everything they said, I agree with um, this this is a complicated issue because so much of the substance abuse starts with some, for, for some other reason. Um, a big part of it is mental, uh, mental health. And I think a lot of people in the restaurant industry, I have also lost friends to suicide. I've lost uh, employees to overdoses. I've seen a lot of this pain firsthand. And um, it's really not a simple thing to answer. I can't answer honestly if the substance abuse has gone up or down in my industry, because I don't see what people are doing outside of my restaurant. I only see what they do when they're here. And I can usually tell if they're not doing well. Um, but that's only the tip of the iceberg, right? We can check in with them. We can ask them how they're doing, but they, uh, we need them to feel um, like they're in a safe place and that they are comfortable answering those questions. And a lot of times it's really tough to get through to people. Um, so Similarly to what Paul was just talking about, we implemented a lot of a lot of um, programs in our in our restaurants over the past few years. In fact, a lot of this happened before the pandemic, uh, but it's just become more valuable since then. Um, the first thing we stopped doing was uh, shift drinks. Uh, for those people who have been in the restaurant industry for a long time, it was sort of just understood at the end of your shift, especially for those who work in kitchens, you get a beer or two or you get a shot of beer you know, and you're cleaning up the kitchen, it's been 10 hours of being on your feet, working, working really hard. And uh, that kind of, you know, uh, dulls the edge. Uh, and um, what we decided a long time ago is if we want a better staff that people that are mentally together and are not showing up super hungover or worse, uh, that we probably shouldn't kickstart their buzz at the end of their shift and send them off to the bars, you know, so we we cut out the alcohol. Uh, we implemented some like um, yoga and exercise regimens. Uh, it's, you know, it's all voluntary. People don't have to go to a yoga class, but uh, we give them kind of options uh, where they can get acupuncture or massage or just a, a coupon to go get a pizza somewhere sometimes can make a big difference. Um, additionally, we, uh, we, we partnered up with a psychologist who has this program different, different than Chow, but we also re refer people to Chow all the time um, where we have a hotline and it's on our walls in our restaurant where if people need to talk to someone, it's totally anonymous. And we have found that that really, um, that helps kind of get people to take that first step when they know that um, they don't have to ask us permission. They don't have to ask us to pay for it. We get the bill from, from this psychologist who, um, just does sessions. And so they can call at any point. They can either schedule something or if it's really uh, a big deal, they can talk right then and there. And uh, we, you know, we make sure everyone understands that it's, it's free and it's anonymous and that um, nobody that works with them or uh, above them will ever know that they made that phone call. And uh, that has gone a long way. Um, I do believe uh, there is a major substance abuse issue in our industry. I think there always has been. Um, another thing that I think has led to that is just the, the really, um, in the, the big inequity in pay that um, front of house versus back of the house gets. So usually the cooks are sort of just really struggling and uh, a lot of the servers and bartenders um, make, make okay money. 
And so what we've also tried to do in the last um, basically two years in our restaurants was um, sort of pay more fairly. And uh, we have actually added on um, in the last year uh, a, a health and wellness fee to our to every bill in both of our restaurants. So um, and you know of course there's plenty of customers who who find it offensive that uh, you know the tip is included, but it's not a tip. It goes towards mental health, towards um, health insurance and other programs that we provide for our staff. And additionally, uh, kind of levels the, the pay. So there's not a single soul in our restaurants that makes under 20 bucks an hour. And a lot of them make quite a lot more than that now. Um, you know, it, it took a lot of uh, kind of struggle on our end uh, to, to figure out how to make that all work and to make sure that we're not alienating our customers. And, uh, you know, we get those, those emails and those Yelp reviews where they just say, just pay people more. Uh, but it's not that easy in this restaurant, in the restaurant business um, to, to make a profit period, much less pay all your staff what they really should be getting paid. Um, so I do believe um, offering sort of anonymous services and then also making sure that people have enough money in their pocket to where they're not leaving the restaurant feeling depressed after working really, really hard uh, to make food for strangers uh, that, they, that they feel like they're getting a little bit of the support on our end. Um, we also do check in with our staff. We do a lot of... Um, like days off where everybody just gets a break. We, we were supposed to have a staff party yesterday and because there's such a bad COVID, COVID outbreak right now that we decided not to have a gathering, uh, but keep the places closed for the day and just give everyone a break and let them know that um, if they need anything from us at all, uh, that, that we're here for them. So I know it's not exactly what the question was, um, but I do think it's all related. I think mental health, um, feeling financially secure, and um, feeling like there's people out there for you can really sort of be the, the point where people might start making the right decisions. And um, having community and outreach like this, like what, you, what we're all doing today and a lot of the programs that I see out there, um, I do think make an, a huge impact because I do think some, especially with opioids and that kind of thing, sometimes that can be second or third tier for someone. They've already kind of, you know, been dealing with maybe some mental issues and then um, other things in their life happen. And as uh, Brother Luck said, uh, it numbs them. You know, you can drink or take drugs to sort of forget about how bad everything is. And it's all good. And then you go to sleep, you wake up, you go to work, and then you just get right back into that cycle again. So um, I, I, I do see this as being a nationwide issue, but I do think restaurants in general have really um, sort of haven't had an enlightening uh, moment over this last year plus, really realizing that. Um, you know, our, our staff is everything. If we don't have a good, healthy um, you know, staff with their heads on straight, we're not going to have successful businesses any longer. So it's, it's all intertwined and it all matters. And, um, you know, we're just sort of chipping away as best we can every day on this problem. Thanks, Hosea. And again, for, for folks listening that, that don't know the industry very well, um, I'll just give an example of my experience I was running a restaurant in, in Denver, trying to live and support myself in Denver, working over 100 hours a week for about 35000 a year. So, Mark, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron, and uh, thank you, Chef Luck, Chef Riley, uh, Chef Rosenberg, for your, for your comments. Much, much appreciated. Um, and the work you guys are doing is just is just incredible. I want to just do a quick round of Q and A uh, before we get to the end of our hour, and and start with uh, you, Senator Liston and Representative Snyder. And actually, I'm going to say let's go in reverse order since uh, Senator Liston got the first word. We'll give Sen uh, we'll give Representative Snyder uh, the first word this time. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you. Um, why are organizations like Rally and Chow uh, important to you? And, and how can we have the greatest impact on health in Colorado? Well, uh, like I said earlier, uh, I've, I'm, I've known of Rally and admired their work for a long time. I'm just becoming more aware of the work Chow is doing. Um, I think that they're essential. You know, there's still a stigma attached with all forms of addiction and abuse of substances. And I think the opioid crisis uh, follows that same path. 
And so I think by being able to have an organization you can reach out to, people that will counsel you, help you get the services that you need, is, an, is a crucial first step in really bringing to light, you know, what's kind of a, a dirty little secret. I guess not a secret, but, you know, something that people aren't proud of. And so it's really hard to come clean and, and you know, and, and admit that you have a problem and admit it to others. And I think organizations like these really enable people to get to that healthier place where they can, you know, take on the the uh, the addiction that they're facing and knowing that they're not alone. I think Brother Luck really drove home that the exacerbating effect of the COVID-19 pandemic, where, you know, literally restaurants were closed overnight and gone for, you know, months at a time. And people were isolated, they were alone, and the draw of addictive behavior was just all the greater. So um, I really look forward to uh, more conversations like this and, you know, more ways that we can uh, bring it into the light and make it more normalized to seek help and to admit that you have a problem. Thank you so much, Representative Snyder. And I'll, I'll turn the same question uh, over to you, Senator Liston. Uh, why are organizations like Rally and, and Chow important and what can we do uh, to best support health in Colorado? Yeah, well, thank you, Mark. And thank you to, to the panelists. It was, it's, uh, it was very enlightening and very informative for I'm sure me and Representative Snyder and all of us to, to hear the firsthand comments from, from the chefs uh, who are not only chefs, but, but you're obviously all entrepreneurs. Uh, you have put your, your, uh, your fortunes, your reputations, your life, your family, uh, everything on the line every day uh, when, you're, when you're running your, your businesses. And uh, certainly uh, for us in the legislature, it's, it's uh, great to hear from from all of you to learn firsthand what you're you know what you're going through each and every day, I think uh, I think it was Chef Riley uh, who uh, who mentioned uh, uh, that that the employees that they that they have to come in every day and be in their A game and you know no matter what's going on in their backgrounds <clears throat> with their lives their personal lives uh, family friends. Uh, finances and so forth, that that they suddenly have to put on their A game, their A face, and uh, come in every day and work, you know, uh, eight or ten or twelve hours a day, uh, go home at night and turn around and come back the next day and do that all over again, uh, four, five, six times a week or more. Uh, you know, you might get away with it for for one week uh, or two. But after a while, it has that that cumulative effect that, geez, I have my problems too, and I have to be nice to the public because those are the ones who are partially paying my salary. Uh, and uh, uh, because if I don't, you know, it, it's a bad reflection on me or, or my employer or the restaurant. So it's uh, it's uh, like I say, very uh, very helpful that uh, for us to realize that that the employees, uh, which are not really just your employees, they're your friends and your family and your staff. You've been working with these people day in and day out for weeks or years on end. So, uh, uh, you know, for, for these, uh, for everybody, uh, then you throw COVID on top of that and uh, other personal matters that, that, that may occur. And then they suddenly say, well, gosh, the only way I could turn to is through a drug or alcohol addiction, which just exacerbates that, that downward spiral. So uh, uh, it's been very useful for me and my probably other legislative colleagues that when we go back into session here in another 48 hours or less, that, that it gives us a good in-depth perspective to hear from people who are in the trenches day in and day out and uh, uh, that can share these experiences with us as we work with uh, uh, Chow and Rally and your government affairs people 
that can bring these issues, these true life stories to us. So once again, it's been a real honor to, uh, to hear this and learn more. It's been very informative. I'm really uh, glad that I was able to sit in on this session and hope to work with you more in detail uh, on legislation as we uh, come into session here imminently. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senator Liston, and, and thank you again for being with us today. I want to do a quick lightning round of questions for the chefs who have uh, been so kind as to join us as we get towards the end of our hour. Um, and I'll, I'll go this time in the order that we presented in, and I'll start with you, uh, Chef Brother Luck. Um, you talked a lot about uh, wanting to get more investment in professional help for, for staff. Uh, the need for counseling and uh, to build on what's available through Chow. And I was just wondering, because we, we heard from uh, Rep Representative Snyder a little bit about the stigma associated with substance use disorder and mental health and uh, the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry is one, especially in the back of house where we, you know, we want to be tough. We work hard. You know, we don't like to show those, those struggles. And I'm just wondering if you're hearing uh, more frequently now conversations at the staff level about this, about the struggles that people are experiencing and the need to really address uh, well-being and mental health. Yeah, you know, um, I'm currently working with um, an individual who, before the pandemic, he was working in the industry. Uh, he lost his job. He wasn't set up. He wasn't ready for it uh, when that business closed. And, you know, he, he started living out of his van with his wife. And, um, you know, he's been somebody that's been very special that I've gotten to be introduced to um, as we've started to, you know, rebuild his dream of actually getting a, um, actually getting a food truck and getting a business started. But the one thing that I'm learning working with him is there is so much PTSD and anxiety, uh, which then leads to a hardcore depressive mindset to where he is scared to proceed to actually move forward because he's worried about things that are just going to be ripped from up under him again. And I see that constantly with tons of our staff is, you know, I think restaurant, restaurant industry people, um, th this is a, this is a, a very volatile industry where it's, it's, it's unsure of how to build it and, and how to set yourself up because no one's talking about, you know, how do you get out of, just being an employee, how do you get to the next level? That guidance truly isn't there uh, unless it comes directly from ownership. So, you know, it's one of the reasons why I personally stepped off that cliff and, and began my business because I wanted to be a better mentor uh, to the people in my industry. But I think there's definitely um, a, a fear and uh, a lot of uncertainty about the future. Um, and people are looking for answers. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've shared Aaron's contact to be like, this is who you should call because she can really put you in touch with the right professionals uh, versus like, this is who I'm using because it works for me. Thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership in that way and being that mentor to, to folks who, who need it. Um, uh, Chef Riley, you also mentioned some of these roles that you've found yourself taking on that maybe go beyond the typical, what we would think of as the typical roles of a, a, of a chef or, or a leader in the restaurant business, um, being a counselor and a therapist for, for some of the folks that you work with. And I wanted to ask you, um, in addition to really being there as a caregiver for these folks you work with, uh, are there ways that you also make it a point uh, to take care of yourself or ways that you would suggest for other leaders to, to make sure they're also looking out for their, their own well-being? Uh, thanks, Mark. It's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think so often um, as chefs, you know, we, we, like I said, you know, you're kind of thrust into these roles. And a couple of years ago, I definitely, I went to my partners and I said, I'm not giving the advice to myself that I'm giving to our employees. And, um, that kind of came in a time where we were expanding and, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, all of a sudden th those hacks increased and my, my job duties were changing away from rolling out my knives every day and cooking to, to like leading a company. And that came with some, um, um, some different mental challenges, I would say for myself. And, um, 
as a result, um, I kind of dug into what that means. And I, I, you know, so what does that mean for me? Um, exercise is a huge one for me for that. That's a big release for me. Um, time away from the restaurant with my family and like, you know, without my phone on, <laughs> um, cause it is, it's hard to, it's very hard to detach myself from the restaurants. I, 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 I want to know everything that's going on there. People often go there to see me. And when I'm not there, um, they get disappointed and I take that personally. Um, so yeah, you know, exercise, um, meditation. Um, I do work with a life coach myself and, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a privilege that I have, you know, not, not all my employees can have that, but I do have somebody that I talk to about twice a month of just about like where I am in my own mental space. And if I'm keeping up on those, um, items that we've laid out for me to, um, to be successful, because if I'm, if I'm not doing my best, if I'm, if I'm not bringing my A game or, or attempting to bring my A game as the leader of the company, then, then legitimately nothing else is, is, um, it, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, you know, if, 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 if the leader doesn't have his, um, his or her, um, you know, best foot going forward, then the, you know, we're, we're eventually just going to come off the tracks. So yeah, it took a while for me to look at myself and say, well, what about, you know, I, I'm, I got to practice what I preach and, and, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm better at it. I'm in no way perfect at it, but I'm striving to be better, striving for, striving for perfection. We all have that. We all have that room for improvement, right? Thank you so much, Chef Riley. And so you, you talked about um, that some of these well-being interventions can really feel like a privilege. And for folks who aren't able to access them, they, they really are. Um, and Chef Rosenberg, you really talked about a, a lot of things that you're able to offer to your staff that go above and beyond anything that was available when I was working in restaurants a decade ago. So um, I was struck by that. And you started talking a little bit about way you make this work financially because it's not easy um and the you know these are profit driven companies ultimately so how do you make the business case for for that kind of approach to wellness with you? um i lost you a little bit i don't know if i lost everyone or if it was just you um i don't know if it's my signal or not i didn't hear the whole question um but i think you asked how to basically how do we afford to to do this <laughs> and make the business case. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, we can't afford not to is my answer. Uh, we had to kind of shake things up. Uh, one of the good things about the pandemic was it was the first time I feel like the industry as a, as a whole had a, a reset button. And I know a lot of other operators and restaurants uh, felt that way as well. Like things that we had kind of tossed around for years uh, became a necessity if we wanted to kind of rebuild uh, mm -hmm. So for me, you know, if I don't have a good staff, we are not successful. I can't do all of these things. Um, I wear a lot of hats, just like the other chefs here and a lot of you as well. Um, in fact, today I, I keep looking out the window because we're, we're doing relief efforts for the victims of the Marshall Fire that happened just down the road from my restaurant here. And we've been um, feeding and clothing people that we've never met, but they are part of our community and they're... Um, total strangers and they may or may not ever come in as a customer to my restaurant, but I do feel like without a healthy, uh, solid community, we don't have a, a good place for a restaurant. And if we don't have healthy, you know, mentally and physically healthy employees, we don't have a good uh, business model. So for me, it's, it's just something that has to be done, but we did have to kind of redo our model in order to make this happen. We basically add a fee to the bills and that money is earmarked for our staff. A hundred percent of it goes to them. It doesn't just sort of get folded into the business. A lot of people that don't love that we do this always ask, well, why don't you just raise your prices and pay your staff more? And any, any restaurant owner can tell you that um, the menu price doesn't always equate to higher wages for your staff. There's a lot of um, expenses in this business that, you know, can kind of sort of just get absorbed by the business. But if you, say, okay, we're adding 20% to every bill that's going to our hourly employees, then we you know, we put that money aside every single day and we know how much we collected and then that gets distributed for our staff. And so we've 
we've taken on a different approach. And like I said, it's not, it's not met um, entirely with um, smiles and hugs, but 98% of the people that come in really appreciate that we're doing this. And um, so that's kind of how we fit it into our financial model. We just basically charge a fee so our staff can be taken care of. And if that doesn't really resonate with you as a customer, there are a lot of other restaurants that don't do that. Um, but for us, it's really important that our people feel taken care of. And so it also, you know, not just financially, you know, is, is sort of tracked and we, we let all the, the staff have access to that, uh, those numbers. Um, I think it kind of makes a statement too to the public that like, things do need to change. And at least in our industry, there's been this culture that has been prevalent forever um, where it's just like, you know, you got to be tough. You got to just deal with all the stuff that comes your way, you know, and I, even I think Aaron had brought this up about how you're supposed to leave it at the door. Um, that, that, that That's fine, but then you have to go out the door when you're done with your shift. So we want to make sure that, um, that we're doing a little bit more than just telling people to be tough and we'll teach you how to be tough and just deal with your problems. You know, we're, we're actually trying to uh, support them financially in dealing with those issues. That's really awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Chef Luck, Chef Rosenberg, Chef Riley, the work you're doing is amazing. Chef Rosenberg for uh, the work you're doing to support the community right now in the aftermath of the fires. Uh, really, really outstanding. We are coming towards the, the end of our hour. So I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge some of our other uh, webinar attendees. We are joined today by a few of our Colo additional Colorado legis legislators. We have Senator Cleve Simpson, Simpson and Representative Dan Wu both here with us today. Uh, and I'd like to give you each an opportunity to introduce yourselves. So Senator Simpson, if we could start with you, the floor is yours. Did I get the unmute button? Can you hear me, Mark? We sure can. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. I'm uh, privileged to be with you all today. Uh, Senator Cleve Simpson, I represent Senate District 35. It's uh, uh, dominated by rural Colorado. It's I live in Alamosa, so my district really goes from Alamosa East all the way to the Kansas border. So um, I'm on the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, and really I'm passionate about uh, uh, engaging in these conversations about behavioral health issues and spent this summer on the behavioral health task force. Um, thank you to the chefs, particularly for sharing their individual perspectives and uh, insights. It's really interesting to hear this through through their lens. Um, mine is really through ag and rural Colorado. So um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, particularly uh, Chef Rosenberg's uh, mention of a kind of an enlightening moment. Um, I suspect we've all had some of those. I, I had one um, last year where a, a young woman in my community, small community, keep in mind, um, took her own life and the, the lives of her two uh, elementary school children and really just set me on a, a different path of uh, my engagement and learning and trying to be part of the solution. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, um, keep up the good work that Riley and Chow are, are doing. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Sen Senator Simpson. Uh, and Representative Woog, uh, the floor is now yours. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's been uh, very enlightening just to listen in here, guys. I do appreciate the, the stories and just the information you're sharing about what you guys have dealt with. I'm a small business owner myself, not in the same industry, but I certainly have seen firsthand effects of, of what similar to what you guys have gone through. So I, I just appreciate your stories. Um, learning a lot, uh, like Representative Snyder said, I'm not as familiar with Chow, but um, just it, today was very helpful for me. And I certainly will be, you know, making sure I, I follow what, what those organizations are doing. And I think you guys are doing a great job. And we just all got to band together and, uh, and work with each other because this this crisis, I don't think, is ending anytime soon. So just very much appreciate what you guys do, what you've done, and uh, thank you for your time today. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Wug, and thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, I also want to acknowledge and thank staff from the offices of Representative Tracy Burnett, uh, Representative Lois Landgraf, and Senator Bob Gardner. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. And to all our guests and panelists, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this is a really uh, fantastic and, and insightful and enlightening conversation. I, I appreciate it so much. So much. Um, I just want to turn it over to Aaron for uh, any final comments. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. And thanks again to Rally. 
Uh, I'm sorry I didn't properly introduce everyone at the at the beginning, but I wanted to be clear. I gathered this group together to represent Colorado. We've got Chef Brother Luck in Colorado Springs, Chef Paul Raleigh in Denver, and Chef Jose in Boulder. Um, I gathered these folks together because they're leaders from their city and they're modeling what a healthier workplace is like. Um, so hopefully they've given you a good view of what's happening in the hospitality industry at the moment. And I hope this conversation has given people from outside of the industry an inside view of what what it's like so that the consumer um, can, can kind of reevaluate when they go out to dinner and treat folks like human beings and also look for ways to support the industry that they so much enjoy. Um, I'd also like to encourage everyone to please support the legislation to expand and enhance peer-driven services. The science shows us that peer groups like Chow um, have even more positive impact on mental health and, their, and um, recovery than therapy alone. And if we all wanted, if the entire hospitality industry wanted help tomorrow, we would outnumber clinicians 29 to 1. But there are plenty of us to help us. Um, I'd also like to ask legislators not to cut funding for behavioral health. And lastly, if you know anyone in the hospitality industry, please let them know that they have resources for mental health and recovery. And again, thank you so much for everyone for being here. Thank you, Aaron. And thanks for bringing together such a, a terrific panel. Uh, thank you, John and Aaron, for the work you're doing. Um, and if you want to learn more about Rally and Chow, I, I encourage you to visit the websites at rally-co, so R-A-L-I-co.org, and chowco, C-H-O-W-C-O. Org, um, and they're listed in the chat if you want to access them there and hit the link. Happy New Year to all our panelists and attendees. Um, and I hope you continue to stay safe and healthy and uh, appreciate the wonderful work that, uh, that all our panelists are doing. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Aaron and uh, John, uh, for, for the good work that you've done. And uh, I'm sure you'll have our ear uh, in this next legislative session and we look forward to working with your good people that represent you up at the Capitol. And thank you, Mark, and my best wishes to uh, Brother Luck and Hosea and uh, 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 Mr. Riley and uh, God bless you all and best wishes for 2022. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.